We were all a little tipsy with afternoon dinner brandy when Roger, ever the troublemaker, proclaimed that it was impossible for anything to ever happen. Good, quipped his wife Hanley. That means we won't have to hear about whatever nonsense you're about to try. Roger was undeterred and pressed on. Suppose a bomb is scheduled to explode one hour hence. It's a simple fact that before an hour passes, a half hour must pass. And before that happens, a quarter hour must pass. And before that, an eighth hour and so on, until things can no longer be halved. But a unit of time, if it exists, can always be halved. Therefore, the bomb will never explode. We are protected by infinity. Scott, my husband, scoffed. That's nothing but a variation of Zeno's paradoxes, which are themselves nothing more than puerile games of logic, and have been easily refuted, not least by the fact that things do actually happen. But Roger was not so easily defeated. Do you deny that to get from point A to point C you must first pass through point B? Unless you are proposing that all things happen simultaneously, which is a respectable theory, but one that contradicts our lived experience no less than what I am arguing. I'm going to get the other bottle of brandy, said Hanley, getting up. If nothing else, I hope at least that exists. I could tell that my husband was getting agitated, which was exactly what Roger wanted. Again, you're being a sophist, said Scott. Why not reasonably small and discreet units like Planck's time that are adjacent with no space in between them and yet aren't piled on top of each other? If there's Planck time, said Roger, then there's got to be a half Planck time, doesn't there? Bloody hell, said Scott. I put my hand on his knee and squeezed. Don't get worked up now, I said. He forced a smile. Not everything needs to be composed of halves. That's my only point. I looked to the door of the dining room, hoping to see Henley there, on her way back with the brandy, ready to rein in her husband, but she was nowhere to be seen. As I turned back to the table, I noticed with welcome surprise that Flynn was leaning intently into the debate between Roger and Scott. It was for Flynn's sake that we were holding the dinner party in the first place. It was his first night out since his wife, Aubrey, had died four months previously. He had been quiet and withdrawn all night, looking like he had aged 15 years since I had last seen him, and it thrilled me that he was finally showing an apparent interest in conversation, even if I personally found that particular one to be inane. And so, emboldened by drink, I pounced on the opportunity to draw him out. Flynn, I said, what do you make of all this rubbish? Flynn looked like I had caught him doing something dirty, and I instantly regretted my pushy intrusion, but he did mutter out a reply, looking down at his empty dessert plate. Scott is right. Time is made up of small units, touching but not on top of each other, except, except for one place. There's one place where it's on top of itself. I was struck by what an unusual reply that was but the other interlocutors had only heard part of it. See, Roger, said Scott. Nobody's buying what you're selling. It smells bad. Just because a lot of people hold the same theory doesn't mean that it's true, Roger retorted. Has anybody actually proven that time works like this? No. Then what I'm saying has yet to be refuted. Henley came back in with the brandy while Roger was talking. Oh, wonderful, she said, refilling my glass. We're still on this. I was so hoping that we would be on this all night. It would be even better if this moment truly was infinite, and we could never escape it. We were just wrapping up, said Scott. As the kids say, don't feed the trolls. Well, you're allowed to feed him with one more glass of brandy, Henley, but that's it. Roger opened his mouth to respond, but I cut him off. What did you mean, Flynn, when you said that there is a place where time is piled on top of itself? Flynn swirled his glass of brandy around and continued to look down at the table. You'll think I'm crazy, he said at last. 
You've always been the least crazy person I know, I said. The least crazy of the five of us here, anyway. Maybe I was, said Flynn, smiling. But now... Well, what if I told you that I had seen time for what it is? Not as some theory or mathematical formula, but as something that you can see and traverse. What if I told you that I've seen time like you might see the canopy of a forest when you're inside of it, and it's all around you. And also that I've seen time from outside of it, like you might look down on Earth from space, or rather, like you might look down on a figure-eight racetrack. Because that, essentially, is what time is. A figure eight that crosses itself in the middle. What would you say if I told you that? Would you still think I was sane? If I told you that I was there at the crossroads of time, the very center where the living and the dead rub shoulders, where monsters dwell, would you still think I was the least crazy person you know? After Flynn had spoken, an electric silence to buzz through the room. What had that been? Had Flynn broken with reality completely? Was he telling the truth or some version of it? As improbable as that would be? Roger saved the day and broke the silence. His voice was a all earnest kindness now, full of gentle care. Well, my friend, it sounds like you have quite the story to tell. We'd love to hear it if you want to get it off your chest. And Flynn did want it to get it off his chest. He looked around the room, and after reading our faces, he started in and spoke for a long time without interruption. This is Flynn's story. Roughly four months ago, give or take nine days, 13 hours, six minutes, and 43 seconds, I looked out my kitchen window, coffee mug in hand to see Aubrey lying on her back in the garden. I dropped the coffee and ran outside, calling her name. When I knelt by her side, she was talking out of one side of her mouth, and I could make out some words, but they didn't add up to anything coherent. She was having a stroke, I realized. About an hour later, the doctors told me that she was brain dead. I made some calls so that people could say their goodbyes while I held the phone up to her ear and whispered plenty of things to her myself, and then it was time to end it. I sat with her for some time afterwards, not really believing that it was over. When I did understand truly that it was over, I was devastated. You were all at the funeral, and I truly appreciate that. But at the time, I wasn't really there myself. I was empty, in the depths of nihilistic despair. It doesn't mean anything, I thought. None of it means anything. Aubrey and I had been married for 35 years, building a life together, as they say. Well, what happens when one half of the building suddenly collapses without warning? Perhaps some are able to carry on. I was not. Not even with the support of my friends. Not even with the support of my children. A month into it, those children who had been staying with me needed to get back to their own lives. My friends stopped coming by to check on me. I will tell you the truth, in case you absurdly carry any sense of guilt. I was glad of it. I was so so glad of it. I just wanted to be alone. I just wanted everyone to stop making a fuss over me and leave me alone. Why else would I retire early from the university where I worked for 30 years, if not to cut all remaining ties with the world? My wife was dead, her garden was dead, my career was dead, and my soul was dead. I was quits with life, and it was fine. I liked it, as strange as that sounds. I'd lived my life, I'd had my fun. Now, just let me sit in my chair and stare out the window. I didn't want to get back into it. The thought of getting back into it all made me sick. And then one day, there was a knock at my door. I didn't answer. If it was the police coming to arrest me, let them break down the door and arrest me. If it was anyone else, let them find something else to do. The knocking continued for a minute, and I mean exactly 60 seconds. Then it stopped for five minutes, once again down to the millisecond, down even to the plank time if you want. A minute of knocking, then five minutes of silence, then a minute of knocking, then five minutes of silence. It went on for two hours, which works out to 20 iterations. On the 21st iteration, something strange happened. I found that I was curious. Perhaps that doesn't sound so strange to you now, 
but in the state that I had been in, where life had grown dry and tasteless, it was strange. I got up and threw the door open, suddenly eager to see who had been so methodically persistent in their effort to see me. But there was nobody there. Whatever bizarre, exhilarating joy I had felt died in an instant. So on top of it all, I thought, I'm hallucinating. That's when a distantly familiar voice called my name from above. It didn't call me by the name that you know me by, but one that I adopted many years ago for a time, when I was living with a certain tribe of people. Aubrey was the only person from Western civilization that I had ever told about that experience, out of respect for the people I had stayed with. It hadn't been for career advancement or as an academic study that I had lived with this tribe, though. I ended up learning a lot that subsequently informed my academic career. It had been simply to learn from and experience a hidden and forgotten culture that I had, through random circumstances, stumbled upon. I must keep the details about this tribe sparse, but I can reveal certain things for the sake of this story, which I'm confident will lead back to the people in question. Kitten all, said the voice from above. That was me. Kitten all means, roughly, lucky little otter, which is what they had thought fitting of me. I thought you'd die, no? Takes so long to come. I looked up. And crouched high in a tree was a face I knew from a long time ago. That was unexpected enough. What was truly bizarre was that the face looked preserved through time, as if he hadn't aged a day in the many intervening years. Is this a hallucination? I asked him. It must be. You eat mushroom again? He smiled. No? That must be real. You still same. Still swim with no sea, but different. No luck now right? He disappeared into the foliage, and twelve seconds later I realized why. My neighbor was coming back from walking her dog, and he did not want to be seen. When she had entered her house and it was safe, he reappeared. You think you see no me again, he said, but I see you all time. See pretty lady gone. See you sad. I teach you how you see pretty lady again. You can do is no easy. No fun otter swim, is hard. You want? He was offering me the opportunity to see Aubrey again. Coming from anyone else in the world, I would have railed against that as ridiculous nonsense. A cruel joke or a confidence game with the aim of scamming me out of something. But coming from him? Yes, I said. You sure? Is hard. I knew that when he said it would be hard, it would be harder than anything I had ever done before. I knew that. Yes, we start, he said. During my stay with the tribe, the first thing I was trained to do was to account for every moment of my daily life. Only the tribe had its own way of counting time, which was akin to minutes and seconds, but the reference for it was always changing. For example, you counted differently during the day than you did during the night. That was easy enough to make sense of. But the really strange one was that you counted differently when you were doing a different activities. Different counts for walking versus sitting, being silent versus talking, productive work versus leisure time, and yet, in the end, everyone was somehow on the same page. Imagine that all of you were keeping a subjective count of time, in your head while you're all doing different things throughout the day. Surely, when asked, you'd each give different times, right? but that never happened within the tribe. At any rate, this accounting for time was the only one aspect of my training. Members of the tribe would also try to kill me at random times. They wouldn't try too hard, mind you. Nearly any one of them could have killed me without much effort, but neither did they let me fail without consequence, as in I really would have died if I hadn't defended myself to an adequate degree, the difficulty of which increased as my training stretched on. This scar here is where my neck was slashed. I have many such scars all up and down my body. During all of this, no one ever told me what it would all amount to, how it could possibly help me see Aubrey again, and I began to lose faith in the tribe, which was the last thing I had any faith at all in. Then, one evening, the friend who had brought me there stuck his head into my tent. It's hard, he said. Tell you. After speaking, 
He stabbed me in the chest, leaving the knife in there as a souvenir. Reflexively, I kicked him in the face, pulled the knife out with incredible pain, and began slashing it around wildly. Good, kitten all, he said, drooling blood around a smile. No control. Then he was gone, and my faith, oddly, was restored, as I counted my thundering heartbeats to keep track of the time. About a month after this incident, I was led to the center of the village, where an ancient woman met me and drew a figure eight in the dirt with a long, crooked stick. Time, she rasped. She beat the stick down where the figure eight lapped over itself. Time is infinite? I asked, struggling to grasp the meaning. After all, a figure eight was just a sideways infinity sign. The old woman shook her head. She slowly traced over the outline of the figure eight with her stick. Wave come, wave go. Take hold, bring new. She tapped the center again. Here, is new, is old, is both. I studied the figure. That's where I'll find Aubrey? In the center? The old woman nodded. Then, in a blur, she whipped a blowgun out of her sleeve and blew a dart into my shoulder. It felt like fire spreading out from the wound, up my neck, down my arm. Suddenly, I was surrounded by four men wielding long spears, pointing them at me. One of them was the friend who had brought me there. No fair, he said, jabbing the spear into my leg. Just is. Another spear was swung at me, butt end first, and connected with the side of my head. My world went dark. I awoke feeling more miserable than I ever had in my life. The only thing worse than losing all hope is to lose it, gain it back for a moment, and then lose it again. I was back in my own bed, in my house, all alone. I had somehow failed my training without finding out how to see Aubrey again. I forced myself out of bed. I had dozens of fresh wounds on me, I noticed. They had kept stabbing me after I'd lost consciousness and then somehow had dumped me back in my own bed many, many miles away from their home. I struggled through the pain and into the kitchen, where I made some coffee, looking out the same window through which I had seen my wife lying helpless as her brain flooded with blood. It had been 323 seconds since I'd left the bed, I realized, and 3,259,345 seconds since my wife had died. I started counting backwards. That's all you have to do. You just have to count backwards exactly right, and then you can travel through time. But you must be careful around the monsters. The first variety of monster is what I call the creeper. I've never been attacked by one except at the center, but they're always there, from the instant you step out of time's preferred current. Time, I've learned, is lazy. It always wants to perform its function with the least amount of work possible. If I go back in time and kill Hitler, that creates a lot of work for time. If it tries to course correct itself, which it always will. Eventually, I'm confident, the five of us would still end up here at this dinner table having this exact conversation. But a lot of history would have to change in order for us to get here. In ways small and large. And time wants to avoid having to do all of that. The creepers look like they're made of a silvery rope, twisted and knotted into a roughly human shape. They cast four shadows each, even in the dark, which have their own agency as watchers. And they are always watching, creeping around, looking in every corner. As soon as you step foot into the past, they swarm to you, a dozen or so, and hover around you, hissing, menacing. But like I said, as unnerving as they are, they don't attack. They may make small course corrections, say you knock over a potted plant that you weren't supposed to knock over. They will put that plant carefully back into position. At worst, if they feel that you're starting to become a serious threat to the established structure of time, they will shriek out a call to something that will attack. That brings us to the swoopers, a straightforward type of monster that will swoop down from above, out of the shimmery fabric of time on enormous black wings and swipe at you with their poisonous talons if they deem it warranted. If possible, time does not want you to die before you're supposed to, and that's reflected in the swoopers attack pattern, though they could easily kill with one strike. They first make a series of passes at you, 
attempting to persuade you through the fright to change your own course. If that doesn't work, they will scrape you with one claw, and that is more than enough. Once scratched by a swooper, you feel the effects of the venom almost immediately. A screaming pain shoots through your body and into your brain, making it impossible to think. You are also paralyzed for a time, 15 minutes exactly, and must stay frozen in position, burning in agony, while the swooper makes its landing directly in front of you and stands there, watching you, snarling. You can smell its corrupt breath, see the black poison dripping down its scaly chin. Its lidless, milky white eyes have a message for you. This is only the beginning of what I'm capable of. While it's almost impossible to evade a swooper's attacks, they're not the brightest of creatures, and it's not terribly difficult to fool them into not attacking you in the first place. In fact, that is the key to evading these lower level monsters, your wits. You need to do what you're trying to do while making it look like that's not what you're doing. But not all monsters of time are so gullible, and some are fiendishly clever. One such creature is the Pretender. In its true form, a writhing horror of tentacles and eyeballs, by appearance, whatever it wants to be. I was tricked many times by a pretender taking the form of Aubrey or someone else, giving me false hope, only to lead me right back to where I started from. There are additional monsters in Time's Taxonomy, but it's growing late. Let me return to my story. At first, before I really got the hang of it, I could only travel back one second at a time. That meant painfully revisiting my training in every moment of the despair and emptiness that filled me following Aubrey's death. That was a form of torture in and of itself, particularly reliving that horrible and helpless day spent at the hospital, but the thought that I could change it all carried me through. On the other hand, the advantage of having to crawl slowly back through time second by second was that it gave me plenty of time to formulate a plan. It took me several attempts to get it right, but eventually, I was able to gather the supplies I needed from a hospital. I obtained a clot-busting drug, which, if given to a stroke victim in time, improves her odds of coming out of it. I also secured the equipment needed to administer the drug. Again, even after I had the supplies, it took me a few tries to time it all properly. And these failures, sometimes hastening Aubrey's death and making it more violent, were truly awful. But I kept at it, and one morning I woke up early and waited for Aubrey behind a tree in the yard. As soon as I saw her fall over, I rushed over and gave her the drug at the exact right moment. I waited, hardly breathing. Finally, her eyes opened and she spoke. Flynn? What happened? I felt joy unlike I had ever experienced before, and my eyes filled with tears. In retrospect, I'm grateful for those tears because they blurred my vision. I didn't have to watch in high definition clarity as a swooper came down from above and flew off with Aubrey's head gripped in its claws. Eventually, I learned to make large jumps back in time by focusing intently on a moment and running mathematical equations in my mind. 100 times I tried to make it so that Aubrey didn't die and 100 times I failed. Once, for example, I went back years and convinced her to start taking various medications that are supposed to prevent strokes. But it wasn't really her that I had convinced. It was a pretender. So the next time, I took a different approach. I gave her the medication without her knowing about it. I kept at it for years and years, but it was all for nothing because the medication didn't work. So I tried different medications in different combinations. Sometimes she had a bad reaction and died that way, years ahead of her time. Sometimes it worked, and it got a little more anxiety-ridden time with her. But she always died. They always found a way. Once, a creeper jumped out in front of a car while Aubrey was crossing the street. The driver must have gotten a glimpse behind the veil, because he swerved his car right into my wife. After a few incidents like that, I started trying to get Aubrey to stay at home and never leave. Half of the time it was a pretender I was persuading, while Aubrey was off somewhere else, dying. Other times they let me have my way, only for Aubrey to get increasingly concerned about my strange and domineering behavior and so find a way to leave. Or else, 
they would kill her in the house. A creeper would pull a chair out of position as she sat down and she would crack her head on the floor. A hundred attempts, a hundred failures. Aubrey always died. It got to be too much. The buildup of desperate hope, only to have my love die every time. It never got easier. In fact, it got harder, and I could no longer take it. And so I resigned myself to live in the past, and that is what I did for two years, jumping through time to relive special moments with Aubrey, or even the moments that hadn't seemed special when they'd happened, just sitting together quietly on a Sunday afternoon, reading a book or doing a crossword puzzle. It was better than living in the present at first, but then that also grew too painful. It was like staring at a photograph, knowing that you would never be able to create new memories with the person you love the most. You could only relive the dead past. All of this led me back to where I started, in a state of nihilistic despair. One night, in the present, I made a list of my options. They all seemed bad to the point where suicide seemed to be the most appealing choice. And then I remembered about the center. Wave come, wave go. Take all to bring new. The old woman tapped her stick on the center. Here is new, is old, is both. I don't get it. What's it mean? What happens there? Just tell me. The old woman cracked the stick against the side of my face and I felt a blinding pain. The old woman tapped her stick on the center. Here is new, is old, is both. Old and new, both. Things that haven't happened yet and things that already have happened? Isn't that just the present? You said that's where I'll find Aubrey, but I've already found her, in the past. And she's not here, in the present. Nothing I do can change that. The old woman cracked the stick against the side of my face and I felt the blinding pain. Here is new, is old, is both. I did not want to be hit by the stick again. I looked down where the figure eight diagram was etched into the dirt and thought, the old and the new, I said. One side of the loop is the old, and the other is the new, and they meet in the middle. That's where it's sorted out, what's old and new. The old woman nodded. And that doesn't mean the past and the future. It means things that are and things that are not. The old woman nodded. And all of this time I've been stuck on one side of the loop, things that are. And Aubrey is on the other side now. I need to go to the center where things that are meet things that are not. The old woman nodded. Please, you have to help me. You have to tell me how to get there. The old woman cracked the stick against the side of my face and I felt a blinding pain. No matter how many times I asked, the old woman would not tell me how to get to the center. It was something that I had to figure out on my own. How to get there, how to get to the beginning and the end of things that are and things that are not, how to get to the center of time. I knew which loop I was on, but I didn't know where, relative to the center, I was on that loop. I didn't know how far to travel, or even if I could travel that far. I had never gone back further than the day I met Aubrey, which had been 35 years ago, and going back even that far had been an incredible strain. The universe is supposed to be, what, 14 billion years old? I couldn't conceive of what existence was like a million years ago, much less 14 billion years ago. Or maybe I was better off trying to go forward in time. Maybe I was closer to the end of the loop than the start of it. But that possibility didn't help me because I had no idea about how I was supposed to travel into the future. I had only ever gone as far forward as the present. I racked my brain, scouring it for every bit of knowledge I had learned about time. And after many fruitless nights, the answer came to me. Or part of the answer, at any rate. The swoopers. They came down from above and you could see a little shimmer where they appeared, seemingly out of nowhere. But they had to come from somewhere, and they had to be able to traverse time instantly. They had to, I reasoned, come down from outside of time. I could only think of one way to test my theory, and I knew I had to be smart about it. I had to summon a swooper and hitch a ride on it. To the place outside of time. It would be easy enough, I knew, to bring a swooper down on me, but I also knew that the monster would be too quick and focused for me to grab onto without a distraction to aid me. 
I decided to repeat one of my original gambits, the one where I administered a clot-busting drug to Aubrey directly after her stroke. But I modified the routine to eliminate the chance that Aubrey would come back, only to have time kill her in some other convoluted way. I needed the swooper to take her. I slipped Aubrey a high dosage of sleeping pills on the night before her stroke. Then I strapped her to our bed. I would administer the clot-busting drug, and when it worked and saved her life, I would keep her strapped to the bed. That way she couldn't go anywhere. She couldn't be run over by a car or crack her head open on the kitchen floor. I wanted to make sure that nothing could kill her. Nothing but a swooper. I didn't have to get very far in my plan before the creepers caught on to what it was. Or rather, what I wanted them to think it was. They circled the bed as I strapped my wife to it, and dozens of shadows slid around the room. Once they put together what was happening, it began their terrible shriek in unison. Through the window, right on cue, I saw a slight shimmer in the early dawn, and a swooper appeared. I took a deep breath and braced myself for the dangerous thing I was about to do, and for the horrible thing that was about to happen to my love. With incredible speed, the swooper smashed through my bedroom window, reached a clawed hand into Aubrey's chest, and pulled out her heart. I made my move, reaching out desperately for the creature's squirming tail. I found it just in time and grasped on with both hands. Then we were flying, out of the window, my face scraping against jagged bits of broken glass, and into the early morning, and then out of time. In a very real sense, I am still out there, in the place without time floating in the void. I will be there forever, I suppose, and will forever have a hopeless sense of unending terror pulling at the back of my mind. I've always felt it there, all my life. Now I know where it comes from. In that place, I nearly lost myself completely. If I had been less focused or had hesitated at all, I think I would have. But I knew what I was there to do, and I did it. I looked down at the glowing figure eight of time stretched out below, crackling with a silver electric energy in the utter darkness, and aimed straight for the center of it. I took the plunge. I found myself on top of a tall building, looking down at a busy city street corner. The sidewalks were overflowing with activity and seemingly endless line of black buses was moving slowly through the intersection, in perfect rhythm, in all four directions. This was it. The center. I believe that what I saw isn't actually how the center exists. I don't think that I would have been able to comprehend its true form, in my mind did its best to construct a reality out of what it encountered. I say that because I felt the strings of insanity tugging at me, threatening to yank away the protective illusion if I stayed too long or looked too closely. But for the moment, I was safe and looked down on the streets which stretched on all the way around time and back again to where they started from. I opened the door leading into the building and began climbing down the stairwell. I thought that they would go on forever and I think that they might have. If I hadn't been counting each step, it was just an intuition that if I stopped counting, then I would be lost. It was not easy to keep my mind focused on the counting, even given all the practice I had. At each landing, there was a door, and from behind that door, I heard things slithering and clacking and hissing. I'm in the lair, I realized. This city is where the monsters live and shepherd all things into the flow of time. When I reached the bottom, I had traversed 42,000 steps exactly. I gathered my wits as best I could and exited the building through the door that was there. I found myself in a dark and dingy alleyway now, between two towering buildings. It smelled of rot and decay and I retched. At its end I saw the bustling street where monsters led processions of people along the sidewalk. The people were bound together with silver rope and looked variously terrified or desperate or resigned. Hey, mister. I spun around and raised my fist. A little girl was standing there, eight years old perhaps, and dressed in filthy clothes. I kept my fists clenched and ready to strike. Who are you? I hissed. I'm nobody, said the girl. I don't exist. Do you? I hesitated. It could be a pretender, I thought, or some other monster I haven't encountered yet. What are you doing here? I asked. Hiding, said the girl. 
I don't want to go back. What are you doing here? You're real, aren't you? I can tell. Why would you come here? I lowered my fist, thinking that if it was a monster, it would have attacked by now. I'm looking for my wife. Have you seen her? Her name is Aubrey. Aubrey? That's a beautiful name. I wish I had a name like that. I don't have a name at all. Let me see. Aubrey, Aubrey... No, I don't know anybody named Aubrey. I don't know anybody at all. There are so many people here. I think it will be hard to find her. What are you going to do if you find her? I'm going to bring her back, I said, fully realizing that I had no real idea about how to actually do that. Back to the place where things are? Yes. The girl looked down at her bare feet, which were covered in dirt. Then she brought her eyes up to mine and asked in the most vulnerable voice imaginable, Will you bring me? Will you bring me back to the place where things are? I'll help you find Aubrey. We can all go together. Will you? Please? I sighed. This is going to be hard enough without a little girl slowing you down. Just turn around and leave her. She's not your responsibility. Please? Damn it to hell. All right, come on. Follow me and stay out of sight, okay? I turned and started walking to the street, watching for an opening we could slip into unnoticed. No, said the girl tugging on my sleeve. Not that way. This way. I squinted and looked to where she was pointing. There, in the back corner of the alley, was a hole in the ground, with a sewer grate lying beside it. You've been hiding underground, I said. The girl nodded, and we headed towards the hole. When we were almost there, I saw a shadow edge its way in front of us. The form of the shadow was one that I knew well. I craned my neck around, back towards the street, and I saw a creeper there, halting its march and looking directly at us. Hurry, I said. It's going to call down a swooper. Maybe they can't get us underground. But the creeper didn't call out a shriek. It took a step into the alley and spoke without a mouth. Its words came as an echoing whisper, bouncing off the sides of the building and worming their way into my ear. We know you. It's going to be a rare pleasure to erase you. Before I could react, a coil of silver rope unwound from the creeper's body and wrapped itself around my neck, choking me. The creeper pulled itself across the alley to where I was standing and clutching wildly at the rope. It began to tangle itself around my entire body, and I felt myself slipping away into nothingness. As my existence was strangled out of me, I thought of Aubrey, and now I had failed her yet again. But I also thought of the little girl standing behind me, and now I had failed her. Then the rope went slack, and I saw the girl standing in front of me now, holding two sections of it on either side of her mouth. She chewed through it, and so defeated the creeper. Follow me, she said, and I did, to the underground. We crawled through the tunnels under the city streets, looking up through each grate we came across, searching for Aubrey in the endless procession of people marching to their destinies as the swoopers circled overhead. After days of searching, we were exhausted and hungry with nothing to eat. Rather, I was hungry and fatigued. The girl wasn't subject to such states. Something else entirely was happening to her. She was disappearing. We'll find her, mister, she said, as we rested on the dirt floor of a tunnel. We'll find Aubrey. I know we will. I looked at her sadly. Oh, I know. I lied. She's close. I can feel her. Let's just sit here for a few minutes, and then we'll find her right around the next bend. The girl held a smile for a moment before dropping it suddenly. Someone's coming, she said. I could make out the footsteps too. Stay here, I said. If I'm not back soon, keep going. Keep going as far as you can. Keep going until you find Aubrey. She'll like you. She'll like you a lot. Okay? Okay, said the girl. I could barely see her now. She would be gone before too long. I crawled. Weak and pathetic, down the tunnel to meet the intruder. I saw him there, hidden in shadow. He stepped forward and spoke. Kitten all, you traveled far. His words came not in the clipped English I was accustomed to, but in his native tongue, which I now suddenly understood perfectly. I was never going to bring her back with me, I said. You knew that. Why did you lie? You were never going to bring her back with you, 
said my friend. The balance must be kept. When one comes, another must go. You didn't answer my question. Why did you lie? Why did you let me go through all of this? I never lied. You just do not understand. You said that I could see her again. I thought you meant the real Aubrey, not just Aubrey as she was in the past. You still can. When I die? I'll see her when I die. Is that what you mean? My friend shook his head. When you die, you enter the other loop and your former life is lost. He pointed behind me. Like her. Then tell me what you mean, damn it. Speak plainly for once. Tell me how I can see Aubrey again. Please. My friend sighed. Same old otter. Always swimming without opening your eyes and looking. He pointed behind me again. Just look. Understanding crawled up my spine, raising goose flesh in its wake. The girl? That's Aubrey? My friend nodded. One of you can go, he said, placing his hand against the wall of the tunnel. A spot of glimmering silver appeared there and began widening and circling around on itself. The other must stay. I looked at the portal. I understand, I said. Thank you. My friend stepped through, leaving me alone. I crawled back to the girl, to Aubrey. We'll find her, she said. We'll find Aubrey. I already did, I said, fighting back the tears. I noticed for the first time now how truly beautiful she was. Come on, kiddo. I'll show you. I stood up and offered her my hand. She took it tenderly. I could barely feel her. She was almost gone. We walked together to where the portal swirled and shimmered. She's just through here, I said. Go on now, step through. I can't wait for you to see her. And that is the end of my story. The four of us sat in shocked silence for a long time until Henley spoke for us all. Flynn, what do you mean that's the end of your story? What happened? Flynn smiled. Nothing yet. He turned to face me. You and Roger, you always wanted to have a child, right? You told me that once, but you couldn't. It wasn't something that I talked about often, but it was true. Yes, I said. Will you take her in and love her with all of your heart? Somehow I knew exactly what he meant. I squeezed Roger's hand and looked at him. He nodded. Yes, I said. Flynn sighed. I was always a terrible parent myself, too distant, too far back in my own head to really give myself to them. Perhaps I was a little jealous too of the way that Aubrey loved them so completely. I failed them. They are both strong, sensible people with happy lives and I know for a fact that they will go on thriving. Flynn reached into his coat and pulled out two envelopes. Please give them these. He set the envelopes down on the table, and I want them to meet her someday, okay? I nodded. There's nothing more to say that you don't already know. Love each other, be kind, cherish every moment together, and goodbye. Flynn began to shimmer, and then was gone. In his place appeared a girl with beautiful eyes, which were open wide, looking at me in amazement. Are you Aubrey? She asked. No, dear, I said. Oh, she said. Flynn's going to be so sad. He thought he'd found her. He did, I said. He did. <laughs>